Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about my Week 8 tight end and quarterback rankings for the 2023 fantasy football season. Over the course of today's episode, I'm covering all topics regarding those two positions, beginning with matchups, talking about which defenses thus far this season, on average, have been allowing the most fantasy points to opposing tight ends and quarterbacks so that we can identify the most advantageous matchups going into Week 8. After which, I'll go ahead and talk about my top 16 tight end and quarterback rankings, sharing with you guys my thought process and opinions on each individual player while also presenting statistics in order to justify their overall rankings again there's a lot of players to talk about a couple reminders if you have not yet already subscribe click the like button comment down below i greatly appreciate all the support you guys continue to send in my direction every single day outside of that of course let's get into talking about the tight end position beginning with matchups as you guys can see to the right side of the screen we have fantasy points allowed to opposing tight ends thus far this season on average from each individual defenses. Of course, the number one team ranked is the New York Jets. They are allowing the most fantasy points in terms of receiving statistics isolated. That's receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns in a half PPR scoring format to opposing tight ends. They've given up their fair share of touchdowns, and that's typically the biggest difference maker for the tight end position. If you want to rank highly, you got to score a lot of touchdowns, and hopefully we can go ahead and potentially see Darren Waller for another consecutive week here, find the end zone going up against the New York Jets defense. He'll probably have Tyrod Taylor available to him, but either way, I just wanted to go ahead and give you guys a perspective as to some of the more advantageous matchups at the position. Of course, we want to take advantage of said advantageous matchups. Again, we have Michael Mayer taking on the Detroit Lions. We have, you know, guys like Travis Kelsey taking on the Broncos. George Kittle taking on the Cincinnati Bengals. Good matchups overall. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have some of the more disadvantageous matchups going into the given week. We have teams like the Cleveland Browns, Baltimore Ravens, Arizona Cardinals, Pittsburgh Steelers, who have played extremely well against opposing tight ends thus far this season. But this does not kind of steer me away from playing my studs. I want to play guys like Evan Ingram against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm going to play Mark Andrews taking on the Arizona Cardinals. These things are not going to kind of lead me in the opposite direction. I'm going to continue to start my studs, especially at the tight end and quarterback positions. But nonetheless, just wanted to go ahead present these statistics, and now we can go ahead and talk about my top 16 tight end rankings going into the week. A reminder, for those of you who are trying to stay up to date on my latest rankings, again, besides subscribing to the channel, showing up for the Sunday morning live streams, Saturday afternoon live streams, you can also go ahead and check out Underdog Fantasy. At this current moment in time, if you sign up using code Andrew and make a first-time deposit minimum of $10, not only are you going to get a first-time deposit match up to $500, you're going to get my ranking sent to you every single Sunday morning from my email directly to yours. These rankings consist of quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, kicker, and defense, flex rankings, half PPR, full PPR, all encompassing rankings. So regardless of what you're doing on Sunday mornings, I can help you win a 2023 fantasy football championship for this season. For those of you wondering if you're eligible for the opportunity, check out the map to the right side of the screen. It'll determine your eligibility based on your age, of course, and of course your current location. So check it out and take advantage of the opportunity because if you do so before tonight's game between the Buffalo Bills and Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you can also go ahead, take advantage of the pick em slip and the specific play of Josh Allen, 0.5 total yards, to start off your underdog journey the right way. Thank you very much for the support. All right, let's get into talking about the tight end position. Beginning with our number one, we have Travis Kelsey. Of course, Travis Kelsey, he is in a tier of himself. There's no longer an S tier, it's just the Kelsey tier. In the last two weeks, he has had over 100 receiving yards. But specifically, in each of the last two games, he has also had 100 receiving yards in just the first half alone. In week six against the Denver Broncos, which again, he has the privilege of taking on this week, should be an easy matchup. He had 109 receiving yards in the first half, and he scored 85% of his overall fantasy points in just the first half alone within that game. Now, this last week's game against the Los Angeles Chargers, nine catches, 143, and a touchdown in just the first half. 83% of his overall fantasy points in just the first half. Imagine if Travis Kelsey could keep on this pace for the entirety of the game. He would be in line for some record-breaking numbers. Either way, of course, a monster play and continues to ball out every single week. And that is why he remains at the top of his own overall tier. Moving on to our number two, we have Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews, again, he has scored five touchdowns in the last six games he has played. As long as you continue to have touchdown upside, of course, you're going to be of value, especially coming off another huge 20-point performance in which they boat raced a great defense and put up a lot of points. They should be able to do... Very similar numbers against the Arizona Cardinals defense. And even though the Arizona Cardinals haven't given up very many points to opposing tight ends, they haven't taken on Mark Andrews in six consecutive games here. So I'm expecting Mark Andrews to have himself a great performance as long as he continues to maintain at the very top of the Baltimore Ravens target opportunity in the red zone, which he has thus far this season. Amongst all receiving options in the National Football League, he's fourth amongst all in terms of targets inside the 10-yard line and third amongst all in terms of touchdowns inside the 10-yard line. As long as that continues to stay persistent, of course, Mark Andrews is a fantastic 
big play. Moving on to our number three, TJ Hawkinson. Coming off a monster performance, 12 targets, 11 catches, 86 receiving yards. And those are the numbers that we want to see out of TJ Hawkinson, especially in the absence of Justin Jefferson. Now, this upcoming week, he takes on the Green Bay Packers. It is an advantageous matchup, especially considering the fact that the Green Bay Packers defense is dealing with a lot of injuries. But the last time we saw TJ Hawkinson taking on this defense, week 17 of last year, he had 12 targets, 7 catches, 59 receiving yards, and Justin Jefferson was active in that game. My expectation is that Jordan Addison, considering how great of an overall performance he had last week, is going to pull a lot of attention. And if and when he does, TJ Hawkinson over the middle will continue to be the security blanket of Kirk Cousins. This is an offense that leads the National Football League in terms of pass rate. They're throwing the ball 69% of the time. They're only going to continue to throw the ball a heavy amount of times, especially going up against the matchup in Green Bay. Moving on to our number four, we have Darren Waller. Like I mentioned before, it is the easiest matchup at the position. The Jets are allowing 13.18 fantasy points per game, and they have allowed five receiving touchdowns in the last six games that they have played. Of course, last week they were on a bye week. Darren Waller has had himself two consecutive games in which he is seeing a high volume of opportunity with Tyrod Taylor. 23% of the overall target share, which is fantastic. Coming off a performance in which he had seven catches, 98 yards, and a receiving touchdown. But most importantly amongst all of this, over the course of the last three games, whether it has been with Daniel Jones or Tyrod Taylor, he has seen 26 total targets. They are truly starting to actually use him as the number one receiving threat of this offense, which is fantastic to see. His fantasy upside should continue even in a matchup against the Jets defense where you may think it's a difficult one. I'm expecting him to ball out. Moving on to our number five. Sam Laporta. Sam Laporta has played extremely well this season. In a game last week, six catches, 52 yards. In a negative game script, the expectation was that he could have potentially seen more overall target opportunity, but Jameer Gibbs and, of course, Amon Ross St. Brown, they both had over 10 targets within that game, and it did impact the overall upside of Sam Laporta. Nonetheless, going into this weekend's matchup against the Las Vegas Raiders, this should be a matchup in which the Detroit Lions truly do take out all of their frustrations of last week against this defense that really cannot stop a soul. I mean, last week, they couldn't even stop Tyson Bajan. So imagine what Jared Goff and the boys are going to be able to do against this defense. Sam Laporta in the last two games, nearly 20% target share. The expectation is another great week here. Moving on to our number six, we have Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard in the last three games has been fantastic. I mean, in two of the last three games, has been able to score a touchdown. And in two of the last three games, has been able to get himself 70 or more receiving yards, which are incredible numbers to say the very least. In fact, in all three of those games, at least five receptions minimum. And this is all stemming back from the week four performance against the Washington Commanders. In this upcoming week, they take on the Washington Commanders. And the reason why I bring that up is because in week four, he had very little utilization. Four targets, two receptions, 25 receiving yards, 3.5 fantasy points. After the game, Nick Sirianni, the head coach, of the Philadelphia's came out and said, we want to get Dallas Goddard more involved. And that's exactly what they have addressed and accomplished over the course of the last three games. I'm expecting that to continue going up against the Washington Commanders this upcoming week. Moving on to our number seven, we have George Kittle. I don't know who's going to play quarterback. There are some reports as to the potential of, you know, Brock Purdy being able to clear concussion protocol. Time will tell. But at this current moment in time, regardless of who's playing quarterback, whether it's Sam Darnold or Brock Purdy, George Kittle should be a fantastic play. Primarily because the Bengals are one of the best matchups. In fact, the fourth best matchup at the position, allowing 11.63 fantasy points per game to opposing tight ends. The last time George Kittle took on the Cincinnati Bengals defense back in 2021, week 14. 13 catches, 151 receiving yards, a receiving touchdown, 27.6 fantasy points. I know that was a couple years ago, but at least we have an understanding that Kyle Shanahan knows how to exploit the defensive coordinator of the Cincinnati Bengals. And luckily for all of us, regardless of who's playing quarterback, George Kittle typically plays better with backup quarterbacks. He has demonstrated that over the course of his entire career. Moving on to our number eight, we have Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram, as much as he is a consistent option, he is consistently getting between, you know, seven to 10 fantasy points every single week. And we're not complaining about that at all. He just doesn't have any extra upside. He's going to get himself a 7.4 fantasy week or maybe, you know, 10.2. And we'll take those numbers, especially at the tight end position, considering how grim it is typically. But considering this guy has been able to get himself seven to eight targets each of the last five games since week two, I'm not complaining. He'll continue to see himself a high target opportunity against the matchup against Pittsburgh, in which they should be throwing the ball a considerable amount. Evan Ingram should be a solid option for the given week. Moving on to our number nine, we have Dalton Kincaid playing later tonight against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers matchup isn't the easiest, but if, in fact, we're going to see Dalton Kincaid line up in the overall slot position, which he has done already thus far this season, 54% of the overall snaps that he has played, if he's going to primarily play in the slot position, and now that we know that Dawson Knox is having 
wrist surgery and is going to be out for the next four games, there is a conversation to be had in which Dalton Kincaid could have himself another big performance. Last week, had himself a breakout performance of eight targets, eight catches, 75 receiving yards against the New England Patriots, which again is a difficult matchup overall. Bill Belichick is pretty good in terms of stopping opposing tight ends, but if in fact we continue to see Dalton Kincaid play a high volume of overall snaps from the slot position, we should probably expect Christian Eisen, the primary nickel cornerback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to cover Dalton Kincaid in a lot of these scenarios. Thus far this season, he has given up, you know, top 10 numbers in terms of receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns to opposing slot receiving options. So Dalton Kincaid should be in line for more snaps, more opportunities, and hopefully another great performance. Moving on to our number 10, we have Dalton Schultz. Dalton Schultz, in the last three consecutive games that he has played, has scored at least one receiving touchdown. Now I know one of those receiving touchdowns was thrown by Devin Singletary, but regardless of the fact, he's getting himself a lot of opportunity down in the red zone. Now, in the last couple of weeks, he's primarily seen himself more target opportunity within this offense because of the absence of Tank Dell. Again, the last two games, Tank Dell was out with a concussion, and because of that, Dolan Schultz certainly had to step up, and he, he did. Now he takes on the Carolina Panthers this upcoming week. We've most recently seen tight ends against the Carolina Panthers. Sam Laporta, three catches, 47 yards, two receiving touchdowns. Seattle Seahawks tight end, seven catches for 79. This is an advantageous matchup, and if Dalton Schultz continues to maintain a huge part of this offense, a lot of 11 personnel sets with one tight end, of course, Dalton Schultz should be a fantastic play. Moving on to our number 11, we have... Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts takes on the Tennessee Titans. Again, Kyle Pitts is going to fluctuate in terms of his consistency every single week. Three catches, 47 last week wasn't a great overall performance, but taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers isn't the easiest overall matchup to say the very least. Now going into this week, taking on the Tennessee Titans, that's not an easy matchup either. As of late, the Tennessee Titans against tight ends. Uh, against Baltimore, four catches and 69 yards. Against Indianapolis, five catches for 48 yards. They give up their fair share of overall statistics, but that's just the tight ends in general. We have two tight ends within this offense that are heavily utilized. Kyle Pitts and John New Smith were hoping for touchdown upside. If it wasn't for the fact that Desmond Ritter fumbled the ball literally three times last week, there could have been even more opportunities for Drake London, Kyle Pitts, John New Smith to score some touchdowns within the game. And hopefully in a matchup in which you're taking on a defense that isn't great within their secondary. Hopefully Kyle Pitts should have himself a decent performance. Moving on to our number 12, we have Jake Ferguson. The reason I have Jake Ferguson primarily here is because the Rams are the fifth best matchup. They're allowing 11.24 fantasy points per game. They've allowed the third most receiving yards to opposing tight ends thus far this season. And the biggest issue with the Dallas Cowboys has primarily been the fact that They've sucked in the red zone. They have been one of the worst teams in terms of red zone success rate. And what they did last season in order to go ahead and combat those overall you know, red zone woes is utilize Dalton Schultz. Last season, amongst all receiving options on the Dallas Cowboys, Dalton Schultz was number one in terms of red zone targets and red zone touchdowns. And hopefully we can get into a position in which they start to utilize Jake Ferguson in that overall capacity. Moving on to our number 13, we have Trey McBride. This may be a surprise, but... I just want to put it out there. With Zach Ertz going to the injured reserve and missing the next four games, there is a huge opportunity for Trey McBride to become the number one tight end of this offense for the remainder of the season. Truly. I mean, he is that talented of a receiving option. You go back to his college football days. This is a guy that in his final year of college had, what, over 800 receiving yards, a monster season. Now, from weeks one through seven, the Arizona Cardinals, they have targeted their tight ends on average 10 times per game. That led to seven receptions per game and 55 receiving yards, which ultimately led to 9.67 fantasy points per game and a half PPR scoring format. There is a lot of potential within this offense. And again, with Marquise Hollywood Brown, Michael Wilson, outside of those two, there really isn't someone else stepping up. And hopefully that is going to be Trey McBride going into the given week. My expectation, he should be a solid tight end play and someone that you you should be looking to pick up considering how much tight end utilization the Arizona Cardinals offense has demonstrated over the course of the season and without Zach Ertz we'll all be going in the direction of McBride moving on to our number 12 we have Taysom Hill again Taysom Hill's a fantastic player in the last two games he's obviously seen himself a lot of receiving utilization I mean just as of late four catches for 50 yards seven catches for 49 yards most recently against the Jacksonville Jaguars five rushing attempts 18 rushing yards a rushing touchdown over 14 fantasy points. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to score a touchdown every single week, but nonetheless, as long as Taysom Hill continues to be one of the main receiving options within this offense, and as long as Derek Carr continues to throw the ball 50 plus times a game, of course, he's going to see himself opportunity, especially considering they take on the Indianapolis Colts, who have given up the third most receptions to opposing tight ends thus far this season and fourth most receiving yards 
Taysom Hill could be in line for another great performance here. Moving on to our number 15, Jonu Smith. We know that Jonu Smith is going to get himself opportunity. He has been a very consistent option at the position. And as long as they continue to pepper him with targets, he's not going to be one of these players that is going to score, you know, 20 points within a given week. He has the capabilities, but typically he's going to score himself between 6 to 10 fantasy points. And we're going to be extremely happy with those overall contributions considering the lack of depth at the position moving on to our number 16 we have michael mayer again with jimmy garoppolo returning it certainly makes a huge difference last week only had four targets two receptions and 13 receiving yards all of those overall uh, targets were with Brian Hoyer. They ended up replacing Brian Hoyer late in that game after he threw a pick six. But overall, the reason why we want to play Michael Mayer, besides the fact that Jimmy Garoppolo is returning, is that they take on the Detroit Lions. 12.77 fantasy points per game allowed. The second best matchup at the position should be able to take advantage of it. The final tight end I wanted to mention as an honorable mention is David Njoku. Had nine targets last week with P.J. Walker. Could be in line for a solid performance going up against the Seattle Seahawks. Just wanted to go ahead and throw it out there as an honorable mention. Moving on. Let's talk about the quarterback position, talking about matchups in terms of fantasy points allowed from passing statistics alone. This is passing yardage, passing touchdowns, and passing interceptions. Therefore, we find that the Los Angeles Chargers, Denver Broncos, Washington Commanders, Chicago Bears, they are allowing the most fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks thus far this season on average. We, of course, want to take advantage of those overall matchups, but we're not playing the rookie quarterback for the Chicago Bears against the Chargers. We're definitely playing Patrick Mahomes against the Denver Broncos, and even though he took him on a couple weeks ago, and we all know it was a very underwhelming performance, I'm expecting for him to get back on track. But either way, I just wanted to go ahead and talk about some of the more advantageous matchups. Let's talk about some of the tougher matchups. The Baltimore Ravens, the Cleveland Browns, the Buffalo Bills, the New Orleans Saints. They have certainly played extremely well against the opposing quarterbacks thus far this season. Just want to go ahead, present these statistics to all of you guys, give you guys an understanding as to what we could potentially see based on the efforts of the 11 other defenders on the opposite side of the field trying to stop our quarterbacks. But now that I've gone ahead and presented this, let's get into talking about my top 16 quarterback rankings, beginning with the number one, Patrick Mahomes. Like I mentioned earlier, I trust the idea that Patrick Mahomes will be able to get the job done, despite the fact that just a couple weeks ago against the Denver Broncos, he didn't have the greatest game. But in that overall matchup in week six against Denver, one for five in the red zone, one for two on goal to go situations. If they clean up that overall situation, of course, he's going to have himself another big performance. He's coming off of a game in which he had 424 passing yards and four passing touchdowns, and they barely scored in the second half. Really were shut down for majority of the second half until finally the gates kind of blew open. Nonetheless, the Kansas City Chiefs have a 16-game winning streak against the Denver Broncos. So regardless of how well the Broncos play, I expect Patrick Mahomes to have himself another great performance within the given week. Moving on to our number two, we have Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson has been unstoppable as of late. Just looking at his overall passing completion percentage, thus far this season in the seven games he has played, six of those games consist of a 70% or higher passing completion percentage. I mean, that's better than you know Josh Allen thus far this season. Lamar Jackson with Todd Monken has truly developed into a monster of a quarterback. 357 passing yards, three passing touchdowns, Nine rushing attempts, 36 rushing yards, a rushing touchdown last week, nearly 34 fantasy points. But when we talk about, besides the passing work and his overall development there, he is still getting it done on the ground. I mean, I talked about, you know, nine rushing attempts, 36 and a touchdown. Thus far this season, he is averaging 10 rushing attempts per game and averaging 9.47 fantasy points per game just off rushing statistics alone. We know this is an advantageous matchup. So as long as he's going to get himself nearly, you know, 17 fantasy points from the Arizona Cardinals through the air, imagine the additional 10 points he'll get on the ground, making him, of course, another one of these fantastic plays at the quarterback position. Number three, we have Jalen Hurts. He takes on a division rival in the Washington Commanders. The last time these two teams played, of course, a high scoring event went to overtime. But nonetheless, we still ended up seeing Jalen Hurts put up 24.16 fantasy points. If, in fact, the Washington Commanders defense is going to continue to play as badly as they have, it is going to be an advantageous matchup again for Jalen Hurts. I mean, just this last week, we just saw Tyrod Taylor torched his defense for 279 passing yards, two passing touchdowns, and zero turnovers. There is an expectation going up against the Washington Commanders that Jalen Hurts and this offense at a full capacity should be able to once again put up a pretty number against that defense. Moving on to our number four, we have Josh Allen. Josh Allen plays later tonight against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The issue with Josh Allen is not only is he trying to speed run the record for most interceptions thrown in a season. I mean, he's truly trying to. Uh, I don't think he'll catch, you know, Jameis Winston-esque numbers. But nonetheless, he turns over the ball a lot. Luckily for him, when he turns over the ball and they get put into bad scenarios... Oftentimes in the second half, he's throwing for majority of the game. 
and oftentimes it's forcing them to continue to have to stay on the field and score in comparison to those games earlier this season, which they were blowing out, you know, the Las Vegas Raiders are blowing out the Washington Commanders. He's consistently having to stay on the field and put up a higher volume of fantasy points, which is fantastic. Now, besides his turnovers, putting themselves in negative situations, there's also the defense for the Buffalo Bills who have often put themselves in negative positions. In the last two games, the Bills offense has not had more yards than the opposing offense because, of course, the Buffalo Bills defense dealing with a lot of injuries have had a you know, couple pretty numbers put on them. Nonetheless, in four out of the last five games, we have seen Josh Allen find the end zone via his legs. Those six-point touchdowns certainly make a huge difference, and as long as we continue to see Josh Allen have these negative game scripts and have to continue to score in second halves. Of course, we're expecting a big performance here on a short week against the Tampa Bay defense. Moving on to our A tier, the number five player, we have Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert last week was awful. In the first half, looked like a decent quarterback, but in the second half was a completely different quarterback. Was seven for 16 passing, had a 44% passing completion percentage, 100 passing yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions in the second half. An unbelievably disappointing performance to say the very least but this upcoming week has an opportunity to go ahead and take advantage of the matchup taking on the fourth best matchup of the position the chicago bears are allowing nearly 17 fantasy points per game in terms of passing statistics isolated there is an expectation that justin herbert as long as he you know doesn't overthrow keenan allen for another consecutive week for a touchdown should have himself a solid week within the matchup moving on to our number six we have Tua tongue of iloa i know that Tua tongue of iloa in week two against the new england patriots only had 12.26 fantasy points i know many of you guys were worrying in the comment section about is tyree kill gonna play is raheem most gonna play i can assure you even without the practice reports available they're probably going to play it this week. I mean, you guys have to remember that Wednesday practice reports are quite irrelevant in comparison to Friday practice reports. So keep that in mind. Do not let Wednesday practice reports freak you out in any sort of capacity. Uh, on top of it, besides Tua Tagovailoa having himself a lackluster performance last time he took on the New England Patriots, we have an opportunity for Tua taking on Bill Belichick once again. Again, throughout his entire career, he is undefeated within the matchup. This time around, hopefully, we'll have a full healthy Jalen Waddle. I know he was dealing with a little bit of an injury last game, but he did end up coming back within that game. Game. As long as this offense can protect Tua Tagovailoa and prevent him from getting pressured up the middle, which has definitely been the biggest issue for him, he'll of course have himself another solid performance here. Moving on to our number seven, we have Jared Goff. Jared Goff last week, of course, in a negative game script, threw the ball over 50 times. This is not an offense that is you know, going to be able to succeed consistently in a drop back passing game. Their scheme is really not built for it. They want to go ahead and run the ball and they want to, you know, pass the ball with a lead. They want to utilize play action and they weren't able to do so, you know, much in the second half. And that's why despite 33 overall passing completions, he only had 284 passing yards because all of his overall completions are not down the field. They're short overall passes, dumped offs to, you know, guys like Jameer Gibbs, Sam Laporta, Amon Ross St. Brown that are close to the line of scrimmage. Nonetheless, taking on the Las Vegas Raiders this week, this should be an advantageous matchup. If Tyson Bajan can go into the matchup and dominate against that defense, why not Jared Goff and the boys? Moving on to our number eight, we have Trevor Lawrence. Again, Trevor Lawrence, last week, we were all a little bit worried about whether or not he'd be fully healthy for that Thursday night game. The dude had 59 rushing yards within the contest, looked perfectly healthy, was fine, had a 69% passing completion percentage, great overall numbers in terms of his effectiveness. This upcoming week, they take on the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's the 11th best matchup. They're allowing nearly 14 fantasy points per game in terms of passing statistics alone to opposing quarterbacks. The expectation is that if, in fact, Zay Jones also returns this week, this passing attack will be even more valuable and hopefully increases the overall upside of Trevor Lawrence. Moving on to our number nine, we have Dak Prescott coming off of the bye week. Like I mentioned earlier with Jake Ferguson, the biggest issue with this offense is their lack of production in the red zone. If in fact Dak Prescott can go ahead and address that, and they will have already addressed that in the bye week, and hopefully Dak Prescott can get more comfortable with using his legs, especially down in the red zone, we have an opportunity for him to be even more fantasy relevant. I mean, the last time out had himself seven rushing attempts, 40 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown. That rushing touchdown in the red zone, zone read, keep, and he went all the way untouched into the end zone. There is a possibility where we could see Dak Prescott utilize his legs far more often than we normally have over the course of the last couple of seasons. Of course, after that ankle injury, and if he's far more comfortable with those scenarios, the red zone woes may not be as impactful as they have been in the past. And hopefully, if they can address that going up against the matchup with the LA Rams, should be a solid week. Moving on to my number 10, we have Joe Burrow. Again, Joe Burrow, another one of these solid players at the quarterback position. He has had himself since week five, a couple weeks now to rehab that calf and get fully healthy. And we all know that a full healthy Joe Burrow is capable of top five numbers every single week, especially with a full healthy T Higgins now returning. They take on the San Francisco 49ers defense who have certainly struggled over the course of the last couple weeks now. 
their secondary has been burnt. I mean, the fact that they could not stop Jordan Addison, they couldn't stop KJ Osborne, TJ Hawkinson, uh, you know, even Brandon Powell. The expectation is that Joe Burrow should be able to light up this defense if someone like Kirk Cousins was so easily able to do so. And if, in fact, Sam Donald is starting for the opposing team, that could lead to extra possessions for this offense. And if, in fact, it does, Joe Burrow could be even more valuable. Moving on to our number 11 to close out the B tier, we have Kirk Cousins. I just talked about it just moments ago. Kirk Cousins was incredible. I mean, that's one of the best games I have ever seen him play. A 78% passing completion percentage against the San Francisco 49ers defense. 380 passing yards, two passing touchdowns. Yes, he threw an interception early, but again, it was pretty tight coverage. Try to fit it in within that window. Nonetheless, that is one of the most impressive performances I have seen Kirk Cousins put forward. And hopefully he's going to continue to ride that momentum. I mean, they've won three out of the last four games. They've only lost to the Kansas City Chiefs, and it wasn't by very many points. And they've been able to capture victories in back-to-back -back weeks without Justin Jefferson. They're going up against the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers are the worst team in the NFL in terms of first-half scoring, only putting up 4.3 points per game. The expectation is that there's a chance that the Minnesota Vikings can boat race the Green Bay Packers out of this overall matchup. Moving on to our number 12, we have C.J. Stroud coming off the bye week. C.J. Stroud, four out of the last five games two or more passing touchdowns. We'll take that. Of course, he's continuing to put up a great volume of fantasy points. He takes on an advantageous matchup, taking on the Carolina Panthers, who are allowing nearly 14 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. I know that the Carolina Panthers' run-stop defense is non-existent, but that's only going to open up more and more opportunity in terms of play action for C.J. Stroud. Once this offensive line, Damian Pierce, Devin Singletary, are able to continue to plow through this defense and find themselves a lot of success on the ground. Moving on to our number 13, we have Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford has two incredible weapons, Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. And as long as those two guys are on the field, he will continue to have potential upside of the quarterback position because all he has to do is just zing the ball into their hands and let them continue to make plays. Similar to the way in which, of course, someone like Tua Tungabailoa does it with Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill. Just give your best players the opportunity to elevate you every single week. Now, even though last week, Matthew Stafford had a terrible performance, 14 of 29 passing, less than a 50% passing completion percentage. He has an opportunity of getting it back on track this upcoming week, taking on the Dallas Cowboys. They've got a strong front seven. They will be able to stop the run at times, and they play a lot of man coverage at the back end. If that's going to be the case, it'll open up a lot of opportunities for Matthew Stafford to make deep plays down the field. Moving on to our number 14, we have Jordan Love. Like I mentioned earlier, in regards to Kirk Cousins, Jordan Love in this offense is one of the worst teams in the National Football League. I would say the worst team in the National Football League in the first half. They are scoring 4.3 points per game on average in the first half of games. Unbelievably bad. Now, in the second half of games, they are the highest scoring team in the National Football League as they are scoring 17.3 points per game in the second half of games. Negative game scripts continue to lead to you know Jordan Love truly being 2015 Blake Bortles. He doesn't run as much in terms of yardage, but he is the Blake Bortles. He is the garbage man that in the second half will continue to make himself fantasy relevant every single week. Moving on to our number 15, we have Derek Carr. In each of the last three games, Derek Carr has been a top 15 quarterback in fantasy football. And I wonder why. Is there a correlation with the return of Alvin Kamara and getting himself a lot of workload within the receiving game? Of course, allowing Derek Carr to get to this position? Of course, that, that is the expectation. As long as Derek Carr is able to just dump off the ball and gain somewhere between 30 to 90 receiving yards from Alvin Kamara, just off easy completions. It's only going to elevate his overall game. Like I've mentioned before, 105 total passing attempts in the last two games. I mean, these are unbelievable numbers and taking on an advantageous matchup with the Indianapolis Colts. I'm expecting another big week here. The final quarterback I wanted to mention, speaking of the Indianapolis Colts, is Gardner Minshew. Minshew Mania was running wild against the Cleveland Browns. He was 15 for 23 passing, had 27 fantasy points, scored two rushing touchdowns on three overall rushing attempts for 29 rushing yards. But what he was still able to do was have 305 passing yards, two passing touchdowns. I know that the New Orleans Saints are a solid defense, but if Gardner Minshew and Minshew Mania continues to run wild, the expectation at home once again is that the Indianapolis Colts will keep this as a competitive game and potentially Gardner Minshew a top 16 quarterback option. That's going to cover for me today in terms of quarterback and tight end rankings. Thank you everybody for watching. I'm going to go ahead, put together a couple pick em slips via Underdog Fantasy for tonight's games and close out today's episode. So let's go ahead and check that out right now. All right, a quick heads up. I have been on a cold streak for the last couple weeks here. My pick suggestions have been killing me in terms of this channel. Now, the other plays that I play on the side and I don't even mention do well. So this was one that I wasn't going to mention, but I was just going to go ahead and run myself. But I want to suggest it and hope it just... It hits, and hopefully, you know, me mentioning it isn't the bad luck. We're taking Chase McLaughlin, going 1.5 field goals made or higher, considering the fact that he has had two or more field goals made in five out of the last six games the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have played. 
a short week. The expectation is potentially stalling out in the red zone and more field goals for Chase McLaughlin. Again, has done this five out of the last six games he has played. Now, when we talk about Anthony Davis tonight, with Bradley Beal and Devin Booker both out for the Phoenix Suns, this should be a Lakers win. We saw the last time the Lakers played, again, I'm an LA guy, so the, the, I'm going to go ahead and continue to put, uh, you know, pick them slips with my LA Lakers. But the last time we saw them play against the Denver Nuggets, we did see LeBron on limited minutes. This should be Anthony Davis's team. This should be the, the time in which he continues to have himself great performances night after night. He'll probably be guarded by Yusuf Nurkic for majority of the night. I don't think that's going to be enough. I've looked at the last couple of matchups between Yusuf Nurkic when he was on the Portland Trailblazers taking on Anthony Davis. Davis typically has his ways within those overall gains. I'm expecting this to go ahead and hit. And on top of it, because uh, it has the spicy pepper on it, Chase McLaughlin sends my overall kind of pick em slip from being a 3x to a 3.75x, which again, a pretty good overall play. So that's going to cover for me today. Thank you everybody for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with Hidden Gems. And until next time, thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you guys. Peace.